In grade school, we learned about the 19th century competition between European great powers for control of Africa's natural resources. Today's guest warns about a 21st century scramble for what's left. He's Michael Clare this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller from the Providence Journal. Each week, we try to make sense of the stories shaping American public life. Joining us this week is an accomplished scholar, the author of 14 books, including The Race for What's Left, Dr. Michael Clare of Hampshire College. Michael, thank you for being with us. Pleasure. So you've carved out a, a niche for yourself, uh, uh, focusing on uh, natural resources and the links with national security. Um, how did you wind up here? How did I get to this point? Well, you know, I got started looking at the international arms trade, the trade in, in conventional weapons, and I studied that for a long time. And when the Cold War ended, and the superpowers no, were no longer financing the arms trade, I asked the question, how is this trade going to continue? And it turns out it was financed by resources. It was the oil powers that were in a position to buy weapons. And to this day, that's still the case. Just a few weeks ago, President Trump was in Saudi Arabia and inked a $110 billion arms sale with Saudi Arabia. But poorer countries, and warlords pay with diamonds, with drugs money Ill illegally financed. So I got very interested in the interconnections between resource trafficking and arms trafficking and militarism. One thing led to another, and I become fascinated with the role of resources in international politics. One of the things that you've also done a lot of work on is the link between climate change and national security. Uh, what's the bottom line as far as you're concerned on those issues? Okay, well, uh, I think we all are aware that the climate is getting warmer and that this is going to have profound effects on the global climate. And probably the most profound effect it's going to have as far as we humans are concerned is it's going to affect food and water and other resources that we depend on for our survival, especially water. In many areas of the world, the supply of water is going to diminish. And with less water, it's going to be harder to produce food. And the combination of food security, food scarcity and water scarcity will have a profound effect on human societies, especially in vulnerable societies in North Africa, in the Middle East, and this will contribute to the unrest that already exists in these places. It will make it worse. It will push societies to the edge. So how will that play out both in those areas that you have mentioned and also on the world stage? And then finally, how will that affect the United States? Well, there's a, a chain of causation that you could see. Now, I'm not saying that climate change is going to be a cause of conflict, but it is going to aggravate situations that are already desperate, where you have people living at the edge of existence in very dry areas, like in the Sahara region of North Africa, where people are already struggling to produce enough food to feed their families. And when the drought intensifies, these people become desperate. Often they migrate. They migrate from areas that are turning into desert into other areas of the world. Very typically, the people who are migrating are of one ethnicity. Uh, they may be Arabs moving into areas that are populated by other people who are of different religions. So as they come into contact with these other people, the ethnic divisions flare up and you often have clashes. This is a, a prime 
situation to attract terrorist organizations. And that's exactly what we've seen in Africa, that al-Qaeda moves in and exploits these situations. ISIS is moving in. We see this in Nigeria, where the Boko Haram movement has exploited the terrible drought that's existing there to uh, take advantage of people's misery and their anger at the government for not helping them. So terrorism exploits these existing conditions that drought makes worse. I mean, th this sounds like a bleak scenario. I mean, do you see any silver lining or any, any hope here? And what, what can the world powers do? Well, the world powers could begin by slowing down the process of climate change. But in the absence of that, we have to work with governments in these areas of the world that are at risk in Africa and the Middle East to provide a better distribution of food, to help with irrigation, but especially to make sure that uh, populations that are already divided, that, they, uh, that the resources are divided equitably, that they're not favored one group uh, as, is favored and other groups are excluded from assistance. It doesn't take much assistance some food, seeds, help with digging wells, but it has to be distributed in a way that one group doesn't feel that the government is not, is ignoring them. Boko Haram in Nigeria took advantage of the fact that the government was seen as corrupt and, and disadvantaging some groups in the population. We have to make sure that that doesn't happen. You know, so one of the things that, uh so, so there's a, a good body of evidence that says that the Syrian civil war uh, was it, certainly the conditions were set for it by a persistent drought lasted five or six years, forced a lot of people off of the Syrian countryside into cities. The government wasn't responsive, the spark civil war. And now you have more than 400,000 people dead and sort of a, a tinderbox for even great power conflict. For a lot of the world, the face of the Syrian civil war is the refugee flow into Europe. And I, but I have not heard anybody really draw that connection between climate, security, and then the refugee flows. As a scholar, somebody who's written extensively about this, how do you communicate with a broader audience? How do you reach them with that message? Well, I'll say that one community that has paid attention to this is people in the U.S. military and the national security community. There are many uh, 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 military officers and retired military officers who are very worried about this for the reason that you asked, that this increases the instability in the world, the conflict in the world, uh, that may reach a point where the U.S. military may be deployed, may be uh, required to intervene in these situations. So the U.S. military is very worried about this. Um, uh, here in Rhode Island, you have the Navy War College. People there are, are, are concerned about this sort of thing. So there are people who are, who are concerned. Is there a role for nonprofit organizations uh, to, to help ameliorate some of these conditions? I mean, we, we've been talking about the roles of governments, and we know the many obstacles to unity uh, on the global stage. What about non-government? Organizations. Non governmental organizations, NGOs play a crucial role. Uh, also, the U.S. Agency for International Development plays a very positive role, USAID, by providing the kind of assistance I discussed, providing seeds, helping people dig wells. But NGOs do this as well. Many, many uh, international NGOs play a very important role in providing this kind of assistance down at the grassroots level where you have to uh, get to the people who are at direct risk uh, from, from, uh, from drought. And, and those are relatively simple and inexpensive measures, you know, providing seeds and the ability to provide water. I mean, this is not, you know, to use the old, the old metaphor, putting man on the moon. No, no. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, as we were saying, uh, some areas of the world are becoming uninhabitable. So people are going to be uh, driven by climate from their areas where they lived, uh, forced to move. 
And that's another area where we can help, where NGOs could help to resettle people in new communities in a way that doesn't provoke violence. This is going to be one of the biggest problems of the 21st century, is how to accommodate the streams of climate refugees, as they're called, as, as they're forced to resettle in other areas of the world. I mean, we're already seeing the precursor to that in real time in, in 2017. Absolutely. So uh, Secretary Rick Perry, Secretary of Energy, uh, was made some news uh, recently saying that he was not convinced that uh, carbon, uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, was responsible for greenhouse gas. Uh, and that's a story, that's a narrative that's pushed that we don't really understand how the climate changes, so we shouldn't take any big swings at trying to solve it. Uh, and how do you respond to that sort, of, uh, that sort of argument about really a fundamental question about you know, how much of the planet is gonna be habitable? You know, I, I think my response to that would be, come with me to Florida. Come with me to Norfolk, Virginia, the largest naval base in the world, where the U.S. Navy is being forced to rebuild their entire infrastructure because the sea level is rising and inundating their facilities. Come to the farmlands of America, where the soil is drying out because of heat uh, and where fires are raging. Just this week in Portugal, there have been horrendous fires, dozens of people burned to death because of fires and because the landscape is so dry. I, I think he lives in a bubble. Take him out of his bubble. Come to the areas of the world where climate change is visible to people. And as I say, people within the military see this. They observe it with their own eyes and they say, we have to respond to this. He could visit parts of his own native Texas, yeah. some of the coastal areas of Texas. So what do you make of the president's decision to withdraw from the Paris Climate Accords? I think it's a bad decision for the United States of America. I think it's a bad decision for the people of America because it's going to set us backward in number of ways. It's going to undermine our own preparation for the things that have to be done to prepare, prepare for the changing conditions that we're already seeing. But there's something else. As part of the climate change uh, program, the Paris Accord requires that the nations of the world make structural changes in their economy to adjust to this, to transition their energy systems in particular to green technology. And this is going to require trillions of dollars in new investments. And it's very clear that this is inescapable. We're going to have to move from fossil fuel production to solar and wind and other non-carbon sources of energy. And what Donald Trump and, and his associates are doing are taking the United States out of the race to be the leader in a whole new area of technology. This is going to be the cutting edge technology of the 21st century. And other countries like China and Germany and India now are going to take the lead. They're going to be the beneficiaries economically, technologically, and job wise. There's no future for jobs in coal production and oil production. Those are obsolete technologies, and he wants to perpetuate obsolete technologies. We need to take a quick moment for station identification. This is Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. An audio version of Story in the Public Square is broadcast three times each weekend on the POTUS channel. That's the Politics of the United States channel 124 on Sirius XM satellite radio. You can also download episodes on demand with the Sirius XM app. We're produced each week by a team of true professionals at Rhode Island PBS in beautiful Providence, Rhode Island. My name is Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. You can tweet me at JM Lutis. Alongside me in the co-host chair is G. Wayne Miller, an award-winning journalist with the Providence Journal. You can tweet Wayne at G. Wayne Miller. Finally, our guest this week is a professor at Hampshire College and the author of 14 books. He's Michael Clare and he tweets, at M-K-L-A-R-E, the number one, M. Claire one, Michael. So Michael, um, I was listening to what you were saying about this transition to green economies, and I'm reminded of the fact that uh, 
125 years ago, New Bedford, Massachusetts, was the epicenter of America's whale oil industry, really the world's whale oil industry. And with the discoverer of petroleum, that changed. Um, we're at the cusp of a new revolution in green energy. Uh, there were consequences for petroleum in terms of global politics and, uh, and, and international relations. What are the consequences of the, the shift to the green economy going to be uh, for, the shift, uh, for the shift away from petroleum? Well, as you say, Jim, uh, the United States was the world leader in petroleum technology, and it, 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 it was the source of the, big corp the biggest corporations in the world at that time. Uh, Standard Oil Company of New Jersey, now ExxonMobil and, and Chevron are all byproducts of that. It was the source of our transportation system, our leadership in automobiles and airplanes, and our success in warfare with, with aircraft carriers and submarines and planes and so on. We all know this. And as technology moves away from petroleum, which it will over time, to new technologies, whoever has leadership in those new technology will also be the beneficiary of everything that follows. Global geopolitical leadership, uh, economic leadership, and industrial leadership. And I fear that if the United States doesn't take leadership in this area, other countries will. And it looks like that's what the fallout from <coughs> President Trump's decision to withdraw from the Paris Accord is. You hear people saying, uh, the Chinese saying, the Indians saying, the Germans saying, this opens up a vacuum and we're going to rush in. We're going to take leadership of this technology and, and the United States will, will follow behind. There was a bit of a silver lining, though, in the withdrawal, and that was the reaction of mayors of many cities, governors and legislatures of many states, and I, I want to mention two of those states. That would be California, which, if it were an independent nation, would have the fifth or sixth largest gross domestic product, and New York. And they, all these, it was literally thousands of, of individuals and, and, and states and um, cities, they all said that they would abide by those accords. And when you have a powerhouse, an economic powerhouse like California saying that, and there's a lot of alternative energy being developed there, is that not a good thing? I mean, it, it, maybe it's not quite so simple as black or black and white as the U.S. has to be the leader or, or is not the leader. Well, that's a, that's a fair point. Yes, the U.S. decision to withdraw from the Paris Accord has stimulated California. Also, Massachusetts is right. is taking the lead in some areas, and other states are as well. Canada is under Prime Minister Trudeau is moving ahead in this direction and allying with states of the United States. The province of Quebec has aligned with California in a carbon scheme to reduce renewables. So there's kind of an international diplomacy minus the federal government, and that's a good thing. I agree with you. But that's still, uh, when, when the federal government is withdrawing money, as it is, from research and development in these new technologies, that's not good for the country. Uh, you know, I, I'm so about a decade ago, maybe a little bit more than that now, uh, I was working in Washington. I was in a meeting with uh, my boss and uh, the CEO of an oil company that we won't, that we won't name here today. Uh, and they were talking about the, the American, uh, American oil fields. And the CEO was saying that, you know, American oil fields, this is 2006, 2007, are pretty well picked over. There's, there's no more oil, with the exception of some stuff, stuff up in the Arctic, there's no more oil to be had. And then within two, three, four years, you had the shale oil revolution, hydraulic fracking releasing sort of trapped pockets of oil within the Earth's surface uh, that could be uh, brought back to, to, to use. How did that CEO so miss what was coming in his own industry within a matter of years? This is an interesting story, and many people who are in this field, myself included, 
did not grasp this. And it turns out that there were a lot of small independent operators in Texas and Oklahoma and Arkansas who were working in the shale fields. They were not part of the big companies. The big uh, giant companies like ExxonMobil and Chevron were not interested in that stuff, weren't paying attention. And these small mom and pop kind of companies were perfecting hydraulic fracking and they were the ones who developed this. So it was off the radar of the big companies. And the smaller ones perfected the technology and, and, and enabled us to extract those resources. Is, is, the, is there a bigger sort of a, a lesson there about innovation in the marketplace that might inform the way we think about this transition to the green carbon, uh, the, the, the green economy? That's interesting. I think you're right about that. Uh, and my guess is I travel around a lot to universities to speak on these topics. I'm sure that at every university and college in the United States, there are young people, young scientists, who are working on the next generation of storage devices, transmission devices, lighting devices that a decade from now we'll get together and, and we'll be revolutionizing the energy field. And then we have entrepreneurs like Elon Musk and, and many other people who are betting the future on alternative energy. In the case of Elon Musk, of course, it's the electric car. What role will entrepreneurs, private people who want to make money and through their companies, what role will they play despite or regardless of what the federal government does in terms of investing in research and alternative energy? Well, I think you need a, a bridging between these uh, young people working in colleges and universities making the intellectual scientific breakthroughs and the entrepreneurs who will put up the money to take these from the laboratory stage and scale them up to the point where they're commercially successful. So that's, that's where the entrepreneurs come into the picture because uh, you know a, a college or a university laboratory can't can't do that, can't build a giant billion dollar plant like Elon Musk can do to mass produce some innovation. Um, if you take a look at uh, China's defense spending, uh, if you graph it next to China's uh, transition from being an energy exporter to an energy importer, there's a clear correlation. Now, we, we learned in, in undergraduate school that uh, correlation is not the same as causation. Uh, but it's interesting that there has been this huge increase in Chinese defense spending that coincides with uh, their need to import more and more energy to sustain their economy. I'm curious, your work on, in looking at the resources and resource flows, how does China's approach to natural resources differ from the American approach? Well, I think it's coming to resemble the American approach more and more over time. The Chinese military was originally very much a land army, a ground army, a lot of it having to do with domestic national security, you know, uh, keeping the Communist Party in power mm -hmm. and uh, policing the periphery of China itself. And a lot of the Chinese military is still in places like Tibet and Xinjiang province and, and the borders of China. We don't really worry about that. They didn't have a big navy. Now, however, as uh, China becomes more dependent on imported resources, mm -hmm. as you say, they're building up their navy. So they're now acquiring their first aircraft carriers and their first long range ships so that they could go out on the oceans and protect their sea lanes. This is very new in Chinese military thinking. It's gonna be some time before they uh, can duplicate what we have a long time, but that's the direction they're moving in. They, 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 I think it's interesting, the stuff that I've read, they don't just buy the copper coming out of a copper mine. They buy the entire mountain and everything within it. They buy the entire mine. And I read stuff like that and I'm reminded of 19th century mercantilism. Is this a new era of mercantilism that we're facing? It, I would say it's, it's, it's much more like, uh, well, yes, mercantilism, yes. It, it's, it, to me, it re reminds me of the early days of British and, and Dutch imperialism with the, uh, the 
East India Company and the D Dutch East India Company when you had state chartered corporations that were uh, somewhere in between private and public that had their own armies and their own uh, support logistical system, their own ships. That's the way the Chinese operate. When they go to Africa, they not only buy the mine, they build a railroad to connect the mine to the port, which they also build, and the state shipping company comes to the port to collect, and all this done by state-owned Chinese companies, protected by Chinese private security companies, so it feels very much like uh, those early days of British imperialism. So if you look at the titles of some of your books, I'm going to read four of them. Resource Wars, 2001, Blood and Oil, 2004, Rising Power, Shrinking Planet, 2008, and most recently, as Jim mentioned, uh, the, the, the Race for What's Left. You're getting this message out. Is the American public beginning to, quote unquote, get it, the message that we've been talking about here, do you think? My impression is traveling around that people are, are really getting the questions that Jim asked earlier. What is the effect of climate change on resources? I think there really is an understanding that as we move into the 21st century, that through climate change, through population growth, through other things that are going on, increasing competition, that uh, things like food and water are, uh, are going to be increasingly competitive and scarce, that this will become a more and more essential feature in human life. So I do you have a sense of hope? I have a sense of hope in that uh, my students grasp the importance of this and are going more and more into fields like agriculture that wouldn't have been a job description that me and my friends when we went to college thought of as something. But now farming is and water management is increasingly a topic that my students want to go into because they understand this. We're going to have to leave it on a note of optimism for once. Michael Clare, thank you so much for being with us. Um, he's Michael Clare from Hampshire College. We want to thank all of our audience members for joining us every week for Story in the Public Square. If you want to know more, please find us on Facebook and Twitter, or you can always visit PellCenter.org, where you can also catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis. We hope you'll join us again for more Story in the Public Square.